But no, this is this is behind the behind the scenes. That, there's no such thing. <laughs> We're gonna enter a weird vortex. <laughs> We're gonna come back and find that our children are older. I always said, like, if there's one thing in my life that I could get, like, an absolute fatty mambo jumbo version of, it would be a mule deer. <laughs> Live. I'm Steven Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. Our goal on Meat Eater has always been to make a TV show that brings our viewers right out on the hunt with me. Each episode's an adventure as we journey into mind-blowing landscapes in search of great hunts and killer food. But this episode's a little different. We are still heading into some beautiful country, but for the first time ever, we are giving out an all-access pass to our viewers so you can see the sort of things that occur behind the camera on a meat eater shoot. So first things first, you're gonna be seeing a lot of these guys over the course of this episode, the meat eater field crew. This is director and cinematographer Mo Fallon. I have probably shot 10,000 hours of footage of people, and I gotta admit, this is one of the weirdest moments of my life right now. <laughs> I'm not sure I like it. And producer Dan Doty. I'm gonna have a lot of fun shooting you shooting them. That's gonna be a lot of fun. You don't seem to have a lot of fun being on camera. No, I don't. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. While we all share roles and pitch in, Mo's main job is to make sure the show looks amazing. Where'd that pizza go? And Doty gets us there and makes sure the show makes sense. Easy enough, right? These guys have proven themselves over and over to be smart, tough, and dedicated. From working 17 hours a day to happily sleeping in rain, snow, and mud, they get the job done. We're hunting in southeastern Montana which affords us the opportunity to rent my brother Matt's three pack llamas to help us hump gear into the backcountry. <laughs> these, these, are, these are the original um, Ranello Boy hats that we have when we were like, <laughs> like just turning legal firearm age at 12. If I was out here hunting alone, I might grab one llama or just skip the llamas altogether. But for a meat eater shoot, we want all three to put them to use carrying camera equipment, meals, energy bars, water, and camping kits. About 300 pounds of gear. We load up and hit the road. We're heading down into the Tongue and Powder River breaks for a mule deer hunt. The plan is to get all the way down to the trailhead tonight, set camp, and then start hiking into our hunting area bright and early in the morning. Meat eater shoots are all about time management. So we scrapped the idea of making a civilized campsite and it's every man for himself on sleeping arrangements. This way, there's nothing to break down in the morning. Where we're at right now, you wouldn't know any of this. This wouldn't even be in the, wouldn't be in the show, right? That's why you never see me and Mo snuggle in the back of a van on Meat Eater, which is gonna happen tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lucky turn of events. I was at a NASCAR track a couple of months ago, and I have earplugs. They're gonna come in handy tonight, potentially. I don't know, I've never shacked up next to Steve, but it could be, I'm imagining it could be loud. Yeah, he's just snoring so No, man, like now and then, I make, maybe it's like a breathing kind of noise, which is different than snoring. <laughs> it's breathing through your nose and making kind of a rattling kind of noise. <laughs> but it's not snoring. You tent or are you just going hardcore? I'm just going here. It's actually not bad. Yeah. It's like having mutton shoved up your nose. <laughs> yeah. Even though Mo and I are sleeping on top of fresh llama sign in the van, and Dan is hardcoring it out in the snow on the side of the road, we still hope to get a few hours of sleep. Tomorrow, we start filming the episode in earnest, and it's a long hike into where I want to hunt.
Morning. We want to be ready to start filming at first light, so we're up well before sunrise. Damn. This looks like oatmeal, but this is actually yeah. ground llama from a llama that didn't work out. This is a dude named Sam Haverstock, and we've hired him to be an extra set of hands on this hunt. We call these guys Wilderness Production Assistants, or WPAs for short. Sam's first order of business is making sure our llamas are properly loaded for the pack-in. Putting 25 pounds on each side of the llama. So he's got to pack the pans up so that they're the weight distribution is equal on both sides. So when they're walking and they're climbing up hills or that you don't have the bags flopping from side to side and that weight balances, either tip the saddle one way or another or it'll make it really awkward for the llama to walk. What do you see there? This one should be around 32. Let's get one thing straight. We don't go carting Matt's llamas all over the world with us. This is a luxury we get only near his home in southeastern Montana. Typically, on backcountry hunts, we have to hire two WPAs to pack gear. Dodie and Mo then also have to carry much heavier packs, and they never complain about it. This is getting ridiculous. Managing two ca cameras, a shotgun, and Steve. Steve. <laughs> We're live. I wear a mic at all times on the shoots, and I'm pretty used to it. Mo, on the other hand, not so much. What do you got? This is the first time I've ever worn a mic in my life. He's wearing a mic! Oh. Yeah, he just came up. All right, cool. Now I can't talk smack about the editors. <laughs> Which is like, that's like 50% of my conversation out here. <laughs> now I have nothing to talk about. I'm saying if this wasn't a behind the scenes picture, what would happen now is we would strike off and we'd intro the hunt. All this would have been just there and it would have been like, okay, now, maybe with some would have been in the show. But the llamas are carrying camera gear, like batteries, other kind of stuff like that. I got my stuff like I'd have it. My tent, my sleeping bag, pad, all my, all my hunting gear's on my back. Mo will usually be right close to me. But at this point, I'd be like, on this hunt, we're hitting Southeast Montana for big muleys. Now this is a public land hunt, which usually means thick competition. But I know this area well, and I like to think it doesn't get hit hard by other hunters due to the fact that it's rough country and access is physically demanding. Of course, it could also mean that there ain't diddly for deer in here. Whatever the reason, I hold the belief that a deer in here could potentially grow into a big smoker, thanks to it being able to go a long time without ever having a hunter get a look at it. This crusty snow is just misery to walk on, man. So when it's like this, you can't really do much for still hunting, you know? It's much more glassing based, trying to get longer shots and not just creeping along ridges and stuff like I like to do sometimes. You know, I haven't seen a deer track yet. I just like this place because there's a sense of mystery to it, you know? We hike in on relatively flat ground for a couple miles, and we eventually get to some eroded and steep country. For the sake of our gear and the llamas, we double check and tighten up the animals' packs. They are not pleased. Mm, I'm not having any fun. They are so, like, obviously pissed. <laughs> but in such a passive way. It's not just the llamas that have to prepare for a rough climb. Dodie and Mo have to film me traversing whatever ground we pass through. Their movements around me are akin to the movements of a bird dog around its owner. They're out front, off to the sides, above, below, and behind me, all while I'm hiking at full speed to this particular ridge I want to use as our base camp. The place I have in mind offers good routes to other ridges and glassing points with a strong command of the surrounding country. It's a good spot. Where do you want to set up, Steve? 
Um, I'll just probably set up right by you guys. Once at the top, we work together to set up camp and then grab a bite to eat. Holy smokes, man, look at that. Yeah. I am gonna sleep in here now. I'm not gonna be out there and you guys are in here all sitting around rolling some marshmallows over that camp stove. But we don't take any time to enjoy our warm tent. Finding a deer out here is never a sure deal, and each minute of daylight is a minute we could spend on the search. We just solved the problem that most stressed me out for the past year of my life. What is the problem? This camera. You can only find a way. What is, what do you need to do with that camera? Carrying it up the hill. You know why? Because it's sunny out. You yeah. can't solve problems when, cold. And it's, when it's cold and raining. No, if it was cold and raining now and there was like 45 mile an hour wind, we wouldn't be we solving wouldn't problems. Solve, we'd be coming up with problems. <laughs> That's true. That's we'd be true. like, you know what sucks? <laughs> this will have a tree. We load up and get ready to head out. It's time for my favorite part of each and every episode. You got everything? When I get to start hunting. Finally, after all the planning, travel, and gearing up, we're actually out on the ground looking for animals. The joking stops, our senses sharpen. It's time to get serious. There's one problem, though, that cannot be escaped. We've got three times as many bodies as you'd want to have in an ideal hunting scenario. There's three times the noise, three times the stink, three times the movement. So we have to be extra aware of how we carry ourselves. We keep as quiet as possible, but it turns out that we're not the only creatures out here who might spook something off. Other, more local residents have their eyes on my deer. And here's a coyote from, like, looks like minutes ago. And here's a big deer. There's a lot of stuff chasing these deer beside just me. I know these coyotes hunt adult mule deer, because I've watched them do it. But there's also a lion working here. We're seeing plenty of quality sign. And then, boom, our first buck. When I get eyes on game, Mo's instincts are as hardwired as my own. He jumps into action, falls in line, and gets ready for anything. There's buck number one right there. They're always in here. And my plan was to come around and not cut through here. I thought I went high enough. I should have went higher still, because see, they're feeding right there, and there's a little forky staring at us right there. I'm telling you, man, those dang deer love this area. It runs from here, like, as far as you can see that way. This is a slope for whatever reason. I think it bumped in here as the season wears on, so the quicker we get out of here, get up into there, then we're up there, we'll be able to peek down into this stuff during prime time. way that way we came along that ridge cut down maybe should have gone up another half mile and then cut over because this is I mean there's a lot of stuff I like to look at but I like this. this is what I keep talking about you can see it now timber there's a lot of little park but I don't know why there's always like always tracks near and you see a lot of buck tracks like bigger deer tracks just cutting lines, straight lines across here, just like they're hunting does. All the elements are in place. There's good sign here, and the time is right to start seeing some animals come out of their beds. I make my way up to a high point and then settle into glass. But there's nothing, not a deer in sight. As the last bit of light drains out of the sky, we pack up and hike to yet another ridge where I'm gonna wanna be in the morning. At this point, Doty Mo and I have already put in 16 hours of filming and covered about 10 miles. But after a few hours of sleep, we're up at sunrise and ready to get back at it. It's gonna be another long day. We're coming on illegal shooting light. We got up at 4.10 a.m. 
across the canyon in the dark. I'm looking at a big slope right now. We're just gonna hunker in here and hang out. Let shoot the light come on. It's freezing cold out. And although I think that the weather may be keeping the deer in their beds, the complete lack of animals still feels strange to me. There are never a ton of deer in here, but there are always some. It's eerily quiet. I don't know if they're in there and I can't see them, or they're not in there. But either way, I'm just not finding them. But I would have expected to see some groups of them. It's time for me to abandon my main strategy. Like I really felt coming up here, my plan was that I was gonna find gads of deer on this north face of deal here. Like I've seen them in the past, but there's just nothing going on. I should be seeing groups of deer, but I gotta try something different. Another spot, another bust. We've got a four mile hike to one more location I'd like to try. And even though the path is littered with sign, I've learned to become a little dubious. That's a fresh track. That's a big deer this morning. That's a, that's a buck and a couple does this morning, or a very big deer. We're all a little bit sleep deprived, and there have been no moments of excitement to get the adrenaline flowing. We're having serious doubts about our current situation, and Dodie decides to speak up about it. Steve, mm -hmm. Mo and I are getting pretty meat hungry. These uh, mo mojo bars aren't, aren't doing it. One of my primary hunting goals that I would someday get like a mega mule deer, you know? I don't know why I picked this spot to do it. I just have this childlike notion, this childish Santa Claus-y kind of notion that there's just like a, somewhere in this juniper ponderosa choked hellhole, there's like a good deer. This is just depressing, man. You know what's funny? The Dodie, you never wanted to come in here. No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. You never wanted to come in here. I was like, you don't have any faith. Well, listen, every sentence you've ever said about this place is like, you know, there's just not many deer in here. <laughs> every year, I think I'm gonna like, it's gonna be the year when I get my big fatty. If we stayed here, I'd be worried about even putting a little meat on the table up here, man. And we gotta get Mo, he's gotta go off to the Thanksgiving. He can't be going empty handed. I have to bring something, man. <laughs> <laughs> but know, not the entire, entire Thanksgiving. You're going to be like, what the hell? What kind of show are you looking <laughs> for? <laughs> I've made huge promises, man. Oh, yeah, big old pile of meat. <laughs> don't worry about anything. Tenderloin, don't don't buy a turkey. <laughs> I'll take care of everything. 
Consider it done. <laughs> Haven't seen a deer today. We got to move to a, you know, more, a more abundant location. I wish I had a whole week to hunt this spot. Deep down, I have the undying conviction that there's a big fatty buck out here somewhere. But at this point, I don't feel confident that we'll even set eyes on a single buck, much less a big monster. We have responsibilities. There's a TV show to make, and more importantly, we promised our families that we'd be bringing home some fresh venison for Thanksgiving dinner. It's time to pull the plug and head into some new territory, some country that I know for a fact holds way more deer. Hey Sam, do you copy? I copy. Hey, we've decided that we're gonna have to move out of this area. So would you, when you get to camp, will you start folding up the tent and just packing things up generally? Pack the panniers. 10-4. 